so in this video I have simply recorded different things that are highly resonating with me where I can completely agree things that I do as well and I find it sometimes easier to just record the video that's expressed by another person it means that it helps me feel reassured I get confirmation and it actually really inspires me and it's so helpful when other people talk about their own experiences and when I can relate to it because all my life I have been invalidated not taken seriously even shamed things completely were glossed over ignored and in addition to that there was that complete control from my dad I made another video the other day about just that my dad was super controlling and perhaps he was a pda -er himself because I think autism is actually on my father's side mostly my aunt was rather strange she was never diagnosed of course um, it wasn't that generation and in addition to that it was a communist state so it was not talked about it she was just a little bit weird a bit a little bit different but it was never talked about it as autism or Asperger's I think she didn't have a clue she just felt different and my dad he was actually also shy he told me that when I, he was a boy he was shy actually but he was also um, mischievous he always ate all the sweets stole it from my aunt and did stuff to her from what I heard and he seemed to be at ease with people later on in life he was really good at it to connect with people so I really never thought that he could be an Aspie but well the PDA profile makes kind of sense but I will never know really yeah so whatever anyway <laughs> right let's have a look are you scared of anything or anyone hmm you know what my biggest fear is having an operation how silly is that it's one of my biggest fears i've never had an operation the thought of losing control like that and being put to sleep like that really terrifies me that's it's good. people often yeah they, they often react like that they make a hmm, really kind of face that's my biggest fear <laughs> being afraid of an operation i understand that very well i would not want an operation being surrounded by people who can do to you whatever they wish since you are knocked out it feels like a defilement 
My body, my sacred space. Nobody touches it. Period. And what if they make a mistake, cut away something? It has happened. You can't take it back. Or they forget an instrument inside your body. All of those possibilities. Human error. So that's why I live a healthy life. Eating meat is what healed my body. Took away my pain and inflammation. So I am back in control. My body no longer is producing any random symptoms. Quality of life back online. And, you know, it's important to remember that PDA presents much like a spectrum because it's a form of autism. It's a profile of autism. There isn't one type of, there isn't one type of PDA. There isn't one gold standard of PDA. Just like there's many variations of autistic expression, there are many variations of demand avoidance and pathological demand avoidance expression. Now, if you have a child who is constantly exposed to a partner who seeks to control them and that child responds to that partner by doing everything they say, by being compliant all of the time, doing it with a smile, and you're left thinking, why don't they do that for me? That's because they're fawning. It's called fawning. That is when we adapt or comply or people please because we know somebody is attempting to exercise control over us. And many people believe that fawning is a type of giving in. It's actually not. It's a type of gaining back control. So we, ha even if it's an illusion, we have this sense that we are actually exercising control over the person who's trying to control us by complying, by fawning. So as a kid, I did that a lot. I just had to. When our brains perceive a threat in our environment, we automatically go into one of these stress response modes. From an evolutionary standpoint, these responses have served as well by allowing us to respond quickly to threats and get to safety. But for folks who have lived through prolonged exposure to abuse or trauma, often referred to as complex trauma, the threat never feels like it went away, leaving many individuals as stuck in different stress response mode. Think of the person who seems to lash out in anger at the slightest provocation, fight, or the perpetually anxious person who avoids interpersonal conflict by immersing herself in work or school, flight, yeah, or you can just move away out of the situation, hide somewhere, that's flight too. Or the individual who constantly feels defeated by their inability to make decisions, freeze. These are classic examples to fight, flight or freeze due to trauma. But did you know there's actually a fourth response? It's called fawn and it's a term coined by Pete Walker, a CPTSD survivor and licensed marriage and family therapist who specializes in helping adults who were traumatized in childhood. Well, this is not written for autistics, but still, I think the 
stress responses apply to us even more so because our brain reacts to threats way quicker so trauma happens more likely when you feel invalidated, gaslighted, not taken seriously, shamed, devalued, all of that, or criticized, name calling is another one. Yes, survival, Sarah. Absolutely. Fawning is a type of survival. So please don't beat up on yourself. If you have children with a PDA profile who are, <laughs> you know, who appear to be uh, challenging you more than they're challenging your partner who attempts to exercise control over them because the person we challenge the most, the person that we our most authentic in our PDA expression with is our safe person. It's our safe person. You are the person that we feel most comfortable with, that we feel we don't have to hide who we are with. And as difficult as that can be for parents, it's actually, in a way, an absolute compliment. It is a testimony to the way that you're parenting? In my case, it was more the unfreezing. When I felt at ease with somebody, I would come out of my shell a little bit more. I wasn't somebody who acted out. That's not my thing. Still isn't. But when I feel at ease, that's when I start talking. I'm more verbal. And back then, there were very few teachers who actually managed to get through to me. When I felt criticized, misunderstood, that was finished then. I no longer trusted that teacher. Sensory overload all the time. I had it today on the train. When people come on the train, yes. I want to ban people from coming on the train. It should be my train. <laughs> <laughs> they should give all autistic people first class tickets. Yep, I agree. This would definitely help, but I would not fly to Sequel. That doesn't sound so good. Wow, this is from Emirates. They even have showers on seasonal flights. Look at that. That's your own little space here. And you have a wall in between. This is perfect for an autistic wow just having a little bit more privacy while traveling if you have a random person next to you and everything is so narrow in a economy class flight ugh. It's torture, but this, not bad. This looks very nice too. You have a whole seat here and a screen. Nobody is directly sitting next to you. That would be so perfect for an autistic. And traveling in a train.
uh, that's sensory overload times 10. Look at that. Horrible. And this is a first class train as it looks like. And you see there are just two seats behind each other. And I really prefer that so I don't have to look at anybody opposite me. This is even better. Just one seat. And a lot of space. Did you have meltdowns and shutdowns as a child? Um, yeah, interestingly, they were more shutdowns when I was a child and freezing. Because I was very, very yeah. quiet and shy um, under 10. I was masking most of the time and I was very mute. And I think when you implode, do you know what I mean? Rather than explode, when you implode, I think it's worse actually. Well, it feels the same, but people might not even recognise that you're in distress when you're imploding because you might not say anything and you might not draw any attention to yourself. So there's less of a chance that you're going to receive help. So yes, yes. I was a really very silent child, especially in school. Teachers were complaining that I was too silent. Yeah. So of course I also, because I was on top of that shy, I could not really verbalize what was going on. I could write it down in a letter. I could do that. But verbalizing it, it took a very, very long time until I actually learned to do that in front of a person, of a stranger. And I still have difficulties with that. Verbalizing my needs. Especially when I feel that I will get invalidated anyway. I think I actually learned to verbalize things a little bit better only at the age of 42 that's when I had to work with a lot of people and automatically had to learn to be more outgoing make a little bit eye contact just approach people because that was my job and it took me a while until I got um, used to it and you get routine by practicing 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 there's sometimes things that you have to do sometimes Immediately telling myself I don't have to do anything, knowing that nothing is compulsory, knowing that I can withdraw, even if I have to do it, sometimes it's helpful to trick myself into thinking I don't have to do this right now. And then I immediately uh, restore control. And then, because I restore control, I stop panicking as much and I'm able to reassess the situation. So then I make a decision, you know. But then I have to eliminate the uncertainty factor. So I have to delve into it. Before I make a decision, I have to delve into the thing itself. You know, what are the pros and cons of doing this thing? You know, how will it help me? So I really kind of um, analyse it deeply um, after I withdraw initially, you know, because if, if there's a sense of I have to do something, panic sets in. So don't worry about it. I don't have to do anything. There's nothing I have to do in the world. OK, now because I've withdrawn, I feel calm again. So let me think about it again differently. Yeah. So it's about changing your approach and changing the way you see things sometimes. I basically. do that too. I absolutely need time to think about things, process it, analyze it, maybe do some research about it.
And so it often seems that I'm procrastinating and dragging my heels. But I am in a deep processing state. I'm looking at it from different angles and a lot is going into this, analyzing. And once I had the time to really think about something deeply, then I'm ready to act. And it will no longer stress me out that much. I have tuned down the stress response by thinking about it. That really, really helps. Oh, that's great. I'm glad it makes sense. You know, there are neurotypes that I guess can lay dormant to a certain degree. When I'm in my own environment and I'm happy and I'm thriving and I have flexibility and autonomy, I'm not going to behave in a way that is uh, connected in textbooks with a PDA profile. You're not going to see me saying no to people all the time because I'm in an environment that supports my brain. That's why the environment and the surroundings are so important. It needs to be an autism-friendly space where you feel you can relax and it needs to be really silent most of all and no people no wild colors or no weird sense around. Already that makes a huge difference. And if there are people present, then it makes a big difference when those people treat you as an autistic. If you have to be afraid of people being rude to you or inconsiderate, it will make things really difficult and then you prefer to rather withdraw and disappear and go back to your own private space. So there are people who have been around forever who we don't know that they've been PDAs because they haven't had to contend with the same pressure that we contend with today. So whilst it may appear that there was no PDA or ADHD or autism, there absolutely was. It was misdiagnosis. There were people institutionalised. There were women locked in psych wards because they couldn't keep up with housework, for God's sake. It's, it's just such a myth that there weren't different neurotypes. Of course there were different neurotypes. What is the most annoying question you get asked? Hmm. There are two things that sprung to mind. Um, one is when people ask, are you okay? I don't know why, I just don't like it. I really don't. I find it feels demanding to me. Yes, yeah, it does. When they're, when they're saying, are you okay? Stressful. They probably want me to feel okay. And then I don't feel okay anymore. Um, I don't think it's a necessary question. I think if we know that someone's not okay, I don't think we need to ask them at all. Mm. I think it's obvious if someone's really stressed out. Um, and I feel like it's prying into my private life. Are you okay? It's like, none of your business. <laughs> mm. So that's a really yep. annoying question. Yep, it is. To me at least. Weird question. Do you find it easy?